Um, it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate with you. And I, my work that is forthcoming from Develop Publishing is a collection that is ekphrastic, which, and that just means that it's about art. And so I specifically chose Latinx art, uh, not just because I'm Latinx, but also because the in in galleries um, Latinx artists tend to have very little representation, and so they they at least according to the anthropologist Arlene Davila, that's what she says. And so I wanted to give uh, some some uh, I wanted to write about artists who are Latinx so that they can have more visibility. And it's when with my poetry, it depends on which poems I read, but I went, I was at a reading once and somebody told me, oh, I like how your poetry is not political. And somebody else came up to me and said, I like how your poetry is political. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, first um, ekphrasis, you know, this idea that it's, it's poetry about art. And secondly, to talk about the politics in, in, in the poems, um, I often focus on the subjects that the artists uh, have, have their work about. Um, but basically, in a phrases, you usually have a, a, a certain amount of description, and then, I, and then you have some kind of argument um, combined. So I have a lot of description in my work, um, and I borrow from the Chicana composer Pauline Oliveros, but I reinterpreted her ideas because she, since she's a composer, she wrote about sound and listening. Her, her concept her, is called deep listening, and so she says that hearing is involuntary, and so what I have done is I have used um, like phrases and description to talk about what, what I call deep watching. And so that's why I titled my um, collection Watcha. Watcha is Spanglish for to look or to watch. So with deep watching, I say that seeing is involuntary. So Paulina Olivero says that listening is a voluntary process where, uh, where it, and so watching is a voluntary process for me. Um, focal listening provides details. So for me, focal watching provides details. Global listening provides context. So for me, global watching provides context. And Pauline Oliveros also writes about a, a concept called quant that she calls quantum listening, which is listening to listening. And so I, have, I use the concept quantum watching, which is watching about the watching. Um, so I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so my collection is a combination of uh, pr small prose sections, and they're very short. And the prose sections are a little bit more autobiographical, but they're also in relationship to the artwork that in the section that they're in. Um, and so, the, but then the poems are, are about the artwork. And the poems have a little bit of Spanish, but it's, are mostly in English, whereas the prose has a quite a significant amount of Spanish. Um, and so I'm going to read a short prose section and then some poems. So I say in, the, in my prose section, my fascination with visual art perhaps is rooted in my failure to sustain visual art as a career. I get caught between my destination and origin. I often get asked, where are you from? I recall trying to flirt with a drag queen who was a white Whitney Houston impersonator. She was dancing with some kicks, so I tried dancing along using capoeira kicks. And she rebuked, 
Are you illegal? Let me see your driver's license. Al escucharla, la audiencia empezó a irse del bar. Ella trató de salvarse y dijo, te pregunté por tu edad, déjame ver tu identificación. Pareció que era un agente. And so then I skip around in my narratives and I, and so that part, because the section of art is about immigration, um, I wrote about this experience about the drag queen asking me if, if I was illegal and to, for, me to, you know, for me to show her uh, my driver's license, and I was at a bar, so like it was. I found it. it the The audience ended up uh, abandoning the the drag queen. Everyone stopped listening to her after um, the racist comment. Um, and so then I I I have this section. It's a little bit longer, but. Um, it's got some autobiographical information that I'm not going to read. I'll get to an autobiographical section a little bit later. But so here's one of the poems. This is called Passport Interrogations. Suspended in air, floating, two figures flee diagonally, wearing brush printed hoodies, shorts, and legs to camouflage. Near La Migra, who is likely to ask, where did you go? How long did you stay there? Do you have relatives there? La Migra, with painted red blue and blue skin, sunglasses, cap, and brown collar. An acrylic bird crashes into a circular landscape of a river, while brick facades drape over a wooden peg. Where did you go? How long did you stay there? Do you have relatives there? The fleeing figures have rasquache leaves, for a face, hands, and feet, while Mexican indigenous fabric dolls have human faces and bodies, except for the deer doll, all in a box. The atmosphere of Alcancilla exudes a call para humanizar. In a video, Jorge Galvan Flores tosses a brick to a second video of a laborer. The two screens disjointed at a diagonal, your eyes move. And that one has a sister poem. I want to talk about them together. So I'm going to read the, the, I call it a sister poem. So that one was about, an, uh, the one I just read is about an installation. And this one is ab about some work by a printmaker named Celeste de Luna. Lo que subsume Celeste de Luna. Candle lit, Our Lady of the Checkpoint Relief Print. Protector contra la migra stands on telescopic eyes with barbed wire alrededor. Where did you go? How long did you stay there? Do you have relatives there? La Calavera observa that death amenaza our Anselduin conocimiento of the unknown beyond the bridge. Where did you go? How long did you stay there? Do you have relatives there? Where a child anchors fence borderlines, border, fence borderlands with wind turbines y flores. Um, so, so here in those two poems, I use a refrain of questions that immigration officers have asked me. And I've been to, I've, I don't know what makes me look suspicious, but I've been to secondary questioning and tertiary questioning where I get asked the same questions. And those are the questions that I get asked. The, the where did you go? How long did you stay there? Do you have relatives there? And so I get I was asked that say, those same questions by different people at different in different rooms. And so I, you know, in that in those poems, I I you know I usually use what I call rebuttal politics. Um, so that's in a rebuttal. If for those of you who, who have taken composition, that's when you say what the opposing uh, view says, and then you give a little bit of your own information afterwards, and you, cha you change your stance. And so, um, and so with this one, the, you know, I was using the exact words that uh, immigration officers have used. Um, and then I, but notice I, I, I don't say in the poem how horrible it was, but I do say in the prose poem how horrible it was to be treated as, um, um, to be treated, um, you you know, being being called um, such an awful word as illegal, 
like uh, no one is illegal. Some people are undocumented, but um, you know, to be to be treated that way uh, is really inhumane. And so I mention, I describe the art, but then I uh, use a little bit of my rebuttal politics. I do have some poems in which I'm a little bit more direct with my politics. Um, so for example, this poem is called Chico McMurdy and a Morphic Robot Works Kinetic Tunnel Sculpture. When the arms unfold and extend into arches, you can walk through, pass, a gallery attendant commands, don't touch, as they monitor museum goers who cannot resist the marvelous tunnel robot. To regulate entry is to control the passage, to treat the espacio like a frontera, except the arches only last a moment before they close back up and entrap you. Poet Arnoldo Garcia believes the sculpture is a detention center, but because upon closure of the arms, you must escape almost as if the robot itself is the border patrol that allows entry sometimes, but not always. Tunnel escapes are processional, whereas the sculpture has immediacy. The metaphor, the metaphor of this specific tunnel, according to the curator, Rob Hernandez, is a lot more like an abduction by an alien force. As such, this control is intergalactic, and this physicality makes it real, not fiction. I walk and see flashes of white stripes. So in this one, um, I describe this robot sculpture that I uh, experienced. Um, I did some traveling to look at the art for this, for this collection of work. And so I went to see this exhibit, and the, there was a robot um, of, and that kind of entrapped you, and then it, it, it would open up, and then it, it, you would pass through it. And the, 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 there was a conversation about it. I posted a picture about it on Facebook, and so this poet, Arnoldo Garcia, made a comment about it, and he was like, no, that's a detention center. And I was like, I don't know about that. That's I, in a way that... I did mention it in the poem because that's an interpretation of the sculpture. And it's, again, I'm using, uh, in my rebuttal politics, I'm using other people's arguments rather than my own. Um, but I do hint a little bit about my own stance when I talk about, um, where I talk about the tunnel escaping rather than uh, being trapped. Um, but I do have some poems like, so in this section, which is about immigration and the border um, and identity related to uh, being an immigrant and being uh, a woman, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born in Mexico. Um, so, and, and so I did, I have this one poem called Feminicidio Fronterizo. And this one is about an installation. Nabil Gonzalez's massive cascading sand and abundant name tags, Lourdes Gutierrez Rosales y las desaparecidas, maquiladoras gone, no body, y el alma, por donde estará, discs of illusional eyes, eyeliner, and plucked eyebrows sobre la arena del desierto, terrain shaped like a wrinkled skirt, ni una más. And so that one, um, if you are familiar with the situation of the, maquila, the, the, femini, the femicides in the, in the city Juarez, you recognize the maquiladoras are their, their factory workers who end up um, disappearing or being killed. And so um, there's a slogan that's used, ni una mas, which stands for not one more. So, you, so if you don't recognize that slogan, um, as, and if you, don't, uh, if you don't understand the Spanish, you, um, it might seem, it doesn't seem as political as, as if you knew the context. Um, and then I have, I do have some, uh, I do have some prose in there that's a, that does have a little bit more English than Spanish. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, read a prose section and then one poem from that section. I'm a fourth generation immigrant. My great grandfather was a guest worker who, lo que aprendimos a través de DNA tracing, 
started a second family in the United States. My grandfather moved to this country as a skilled laborer when my mom was a child, also 1.5 generation in the United States. She moved to Mexico as an adult and came back after a decade when I was a child, part of the 1.5 generation, tambien. Stasis is impossible when so much fluctuates, yet a sense of belonging calls for a stay. Finding a place does not always feel at home. Coming home seems to be more of an action rather than a noun, yet a noun is contingent on the verb. En español, el sujeto suele ser implícito, sobre todo cuando escribo sobre el yo. Durante mi adolescencia me huí del barrio para estudiar. Regresaba durante mis vacaciones o cuando estudiaba en la universidad en Austin, regresaba a Houston ciertos fines de semana. Después que falleció mi abuelita, visitaba a mi abuelo o abuelito a pie. Al caminar, más detall detalles lucen por mi barrio Magnolia. Pasaba, pensaba que la canción Valoria de Pixies decía, I adore ya, my Magnolia. Pero en realidad dice, I adore ya, my Valoria. Uh, aunque todavía lo canto de mi manera. Una de las veces que mi abuelo me corrió de su casa, le tomé una foto a una familia cruzando la calle. And what of the children? A mother is trusting enough to allow a stranger to take a picture? How does one define barriers? I could not help but think of the children. How trusting would the mother be when they got older? Would they too leave the barrio and come back or stay? Uh, knowing I thought about artworks that are about place. To what degree is belonging appropriate and what political implications relate to place? Um, so this is about an installation by a, an artist named Stephanie St. Sanchez and I call this Flooded Memoria. Stephanie St. Sanchez's tip, top, tip drop time machine before and the after. A vintage 1974 Zenith television, Rayada, La Pantalla with the image, De La Casa, also known as Penwood Studios, starred a million years ago and yesterday, written on the screen as time lapsed. Since Hurricane Harvey, a soundscape patchwork of songs, sounds, and words from a ghost channel in the barrio. Time to change, you've got to rearrange. What are you gonna do? George Lopez said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Years before Eric Garner and George Floyd. Displaced but present in what has passed, in the past, leading to a ruptured future. Whoa, whoa, our house, family know a time, take a chance and face the wind. Harvey, same people, come back. And so this one actually has some words from the recordings of the, of the, of the artwork. So the I can't breathe, I can't breathe when I, this was, act, this was actually before George Floyd when the exhibit happened and I asked the artist about it and she said, oh, that's George Lopez. Um, and, but I had remembered Eric Garner and I said, okay, that's strange. And then after George Floyd, there's no way to think of those words without thinking about him. So I had a, so notice that, again, I put in a, I put in a little bit of politics without you know, talking about Black Lives Matter too much. Um, but then later on, um, I do have uh, some artwork that I do consider to be political. And that, that I would call more my protest poems. And, and um, I don't always read it. And so I think that that's why, um, I think that's why somebody thought that my work was not political, but the end of the book does become very political. And so I'm gonna read you the, the prose section that introduces the, that section, and then I'll read you uh, the poem and that'll be the final poem I'll read. Um, so here's the prose section. Dublin can create a mutual action El coro de Pauline Oliveros se enfoca en la comunicación oral y participo a leer poesía entre pausas o en conjunto con algún vocalista que canta sonidos no verbales o vocaliza ruidos sonoros. Expulso palabras no digeridas sino dirigidas hacia la audiencia. No es vomitar conceptos, es escupir saliva sabrosa para mejorar el aire con ondas sonoras 
que viajan hacia cerebros a través de los oídos. La col colaboración intercambia resonancia fonética entre nosotros, una amistad establecida por nuestras voces. A veces empiezo yo o quizás ella con la voz magnífica, pero a veces somos un dúo o un eco. Lo importante es escucharnos y respondernos hasta finalizar con un ritmo mutuo. Dublin can create a multiplicity or at least a gathering. Vengo de una familia política que cree en la justicia social y la conciencia colectiva. Es a través de mi servicio a la gente que he logrado integrarme a grupos, sobre todo con la solidaridad de las causas políticas. What is mutuality? I notice the workers and they notice me. They found humor in my admiration for their labor and I now laugh at their laughter. My family believes in union work. At one point, my mother worked for the AFL-CIO. My brother works for IBW, and I once worked for SEIU undercover to see under which conditions managers paid their workers. We were a union family, and because my mother was a Chicana activist, I grew up not being able to eat California grapes during the boycott, also boycotting Walmart because of the labor conditions the workers endure. We did this together in solidarity with workers, although I failed to recognize that we were not alone. What my mom failed to see in art is that art is a part of activism or artivism. Artivism has been a part of many social movements and art can serve as a political consciousness. She admitted that the Chicano movement included, included a cultural renaissance. This duality is a doubling. Throughout my mom's years as an activist, ward after ward, she recognized the collective efforts to mobilize her social justice and that help is communal. So this poem um, is about some printmaking by, a, by an artist named Monica Villarreal. We're not related, although I know her and um, kind of like how you know people for a long time and you know them really well and you say, oh, we're sisters but you're not blood related. So that's, that's the case with Monica. Um, and so she printed some uh, posters. And so this is called Luto in Protest. And I have an epigraph. It's a quotation by the historian Jesus Jesse Esparza. And um, this, it says, the 1977 wrongful beating and murder of Vietnam War veteran Joe Campos Torres by officers from the Houston Police Department serves as one of the most notorious examples of police misconduct in the city's history. Spatial, we are their voices to show. A hatted hombre in uniform, murió por ser el mismo. Say his name, Joe Campos Torres, a veteran imagen on a poster held at the third annual Joe Campos Torres Solidarity Walk for Past and Future Generations. Racist police brutality remembered. Houston Police Department beat and threw him into the Buffalo Bayou with handcuffs. Remember, Joe Campos Torres presente. He died on Cinco de Mayo, cadaver found on Mother's Day. Since 1977, La Familia No Puede Festejar. Now in solidarity with Black Lives Matter on poster, What happens when we fear for our, laws, for our lives? Parent and child abrazándose. Monica Villarreal's printmaking captures light, shadows, textures. Gente que solo quiere ser gente. And so that one, I noticed that I do mention Black Lives Matter, that one. And, and so that one, I consider, that poem, I do consider to be a protest poem. Um, and so um, as you can see, I have a range of Uh, poems and uh, that are very political and not and not so political. Um, my last prose piece of the collection, um, I would say, is still autobiographical, but it. I I think that my narratives, the prose pieces, do imply something political. Um, so I'm going to read you, this is going to be the last thing that I'm going to read. Um, so this is, my, this is how I end the collection. 
My circle of personal pay space is smaller than the average US American. I used to get frustrated that people stepped away from me when I, when I approached them. On the, on the other hand, when I worked as a cashier at a restaurant where all the workers hablaban en español, some of the waitresses would stand next to me, touching me. I don't know if that was natural or if it contributed to the way I was mocked for being queer. One of them put her index finger in the middle of a shape of a V in front of her mouth and then stuck her tongue out at me through the slit of the V. My in induction into poetry started at a young age when I listened to lyrics. I loved rock and español as a rebellion against my parents' traditions and against mainstream US American music, a borderlands prosody. I think of the census as a method to communicate in the world of germaphobes who do not like to touch. Now that there is a pandemic and the norm is to stand six feet away or more, I no longer think that being a germaphobe is exaggerated. Touching air is a risk, a matter of life and death. So contact with another person seems so distant, leaving tactile senses dissatisfied. I know not to, but some artwork is hermoso, marvelous, mesmerizing. I want to touch it. Uh, well, that's actually a longer story. I actually um, w took it when I was in my, during my graduate studies at University of Houston, I took a graduate course in art history that was a trip to Mexico City. And, the, and this was before my dissertation uh, was, uh, I needed, needed to be worked on. Um, but I, during the art history trip, it was a combination of undergraduate students and graduate students uh, looking at art and doing, we had like quizzes and oral presentations about the art we were looking at. But afterwards, um, the, those of us who were graduate students uh, needed to do extra work. The professor said that we needed to do something related to our dissertation about the artwork. And so I thought about it and I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm in the creative writing program. Maybe I can write some poetry about the art. Um, and so actually my dissertation does have a section about Mexican art. Uh, but the, but it's not in the collection that will be published because uh, as I thought about it more after graduation, the artists that I write about in the book that are in the U based in the U.S., um, they are not all of Mexican descent, so it didn't make sense for there to be a Mexican section without me going to other Latin American countries. And so since I didn't really have the resources to do that, um, and the book was already kind of long, it was just easier to cut that section. But, um, but there, in Houston in 2019, there was a, a festival called Latino Art Now. It happens every two years, and, in, and it's a national festival that happens in a different city in, in the United States, and that year happened to be in Houston. And that was when I first started looking at the, at the exhibits of, of, by Latinx artists. And there's, a, there's an artist directory called, they call it Manteca because it, the, the, English, uh, word for, the, the English words for it is Latinx artist uh, I forget what it's called, but I think the last, the initials are L-A-R-D, lard, and so they call it Manteca. Um, and so, it, so the Manteca had a lot of exhibits with Latinx artists from Houston, and so, I, and so when I first started um, reading my poems, it was about the Houston artists. Uh, but then uh, one of the Houston exhibits was by uh, like really famous, um, uh, well, some of the exhibits in, about the Houston artists are famous uh, Latinx artists, but, but some of the exhibits that, one of the exhibits I went to was, is by famous artists from Los Angeles who were, uh, who like the exhibit was, it was a traveling exhibit, so it, it was in Houston, but it, it, it wasn't Houston artists. Uh, so because of that exhibit, I wanted to um, look at more artwork and the, my, my advisor at University of Houston, Roberto Tejada, is both 
a poet and a, an art historian. And so he was the one who told me, well, there is an exhibit in New York if you want to go look at it. And so the, 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 robot, the robot sculpture that I looked at, that was at an exhibit in New York that I went to go see. I also went to um, Los Angeles to look at an Afro-Latinx art exhibit because I wanted there. I am not an Afro-Latina, but my great grandmother was an Afro-Mexican. And so I did want to include Afro-Latinx artists. Um, I didn't read any of the poems. Uh, maybe if we have time, uh, maybe, maybe I can read one of the poems by one of the Afro Afro -Latin, about one of the Afro-Latinx artists. Uh, but uh, I also w traveled to Santa Fe to, uh, because I went to look at an exhibit but that was a collaboration between Native ar artists and Latinx artists. Uh, because I feel that in terms of a lot of, you can be Latinx and be indigenous, and many people do identify as indigenous. But because of the mestizaje, but part of the problem with the mestizaje is that um, there's a de-indigenization, um, in indigenization. Uh, so, th like you, you get separated from. Like a lot of people don't know what what the, their tribe is because uh, because because of colonialism and how people uh, of indigenous heritage were not able to. Uh, um, because they, a lot of people were uh, persecuted or uh, converted or, you know, a, a lot of the roots were lost. Um, and so I, I wanted to, uh, and so the, the exhibit was about reconciliation. Um, but I wanted, I wanted there to be uh, a discussion about inclusion and I wanted the work to be about ce like celebrating the culture I feel like a lot of my poetry in my 20s was sort of like angry woman poetry, and I think that's fine. But um, I, uh, now, I'm, now that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lot older than I look, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s, and um, I just wanted to celebrate my culture rather than uh, do more. And I, it does have some anger, right? Like, like the, the Black Lives Matter issue, I think, is a really frustrating one, but um, but I I wanted to uh, talk about art as a celebration and and a dialogue about cultural issues rather than it just that and to, and for it to be a collective. Uh, so so part of that point of of that last pro not the last prose piece that I. Um, wrote read, but the second to last, where I talked about my mother and, co and collective efforts. I grew up hearing, she, my mom was a, an activist, an organizer, and she would always talk about how it wasn't her alone doing the work, it was always a collective effort. And so I wanted to talk about, I wanted to include all, I wanted to write about all these artists, because I wanted to sort of have a, like a, like a community of, art, of art, artists um, in my, that I wrote about in my collection. And so I wanted there to, again, sort of be, um, so to create some, a network of artists that not only to give them more visibility, but to create a, a relationship between them. And this, this collection was a lot longer than, um, than what I had originally written. I had originally written like, 150 pages worth of poetry. And my advisor was like, you have to size this down to 75 pages. So, I, so there are actually a lot of artists that I had to exclude that it kind of broke my heart to exclude them. But I, I chose the ones that had the stronger poetry. Um, and so in that sense, I felt like I had failed as a poet because there were some artists I really, whose work I really enjoyed, but the poems didn't turn out so well. And so I ended up having to exclude some of those artists. Um, but actually, because I've been reading this work, um, I was commissioned to write about the artwork that one of the exhibits in the Lawndale Art and Performing Center that's um, in Houston um, in, 
it's sort of like near Midtown, but like a little bit outside of it, uh, going toward the museum district. And, um, and, so, and so people have no, recognized that uh, I'm interested in this work. Um, that, those artists are not all Latinx, so, uh, it, so that'll be a first for me. Uh, but I think that, and I asked, you know, well, I, I write both in English and Spanish. What if I use some Spanish in uh, it, writing about an artist who, who is not from uh, a heritage that speaks Spanish? And they said uh, that, that they were, that I was selected to, to, because of the way I write and that whatever I chose would be fine. Um, and so I, I'm going to have a performance there November 5th. Um, and so I have to have the poem ready, and the and and so so again, this is um, this is this is separate from the collection. But what I'm trying to say is that um, at first I selected the artist by myself. Um, then I had to size it down because of um, the the page limit that uh, that needed to happen for my dissertation. And then afterwards, now that I have this book deal. Um, I've been asked to, even though I thought, um, even though I thought that I wasn't going to be doing this anymore, um, I've been asked to continue to write about art. And the, all of my work is ekphrastic, so I do have a, uh, I started a memoir and I t take photographs and, and I write about it. And then I'm also writing, a, I'm also now writing a, a collection of poetry about uh, my mourning for my mom and other people who, who have passed away, my loved ones. And so I made drawings about them. They don't look like them. My drawing skills um, are not as good as I'd like for them to be. But uh, they're interpretive drawings of the people. And, the, and so I, my work is still ekphrastic. It's still doing this idea of description and then argument or narrate, a little bit of narration. Uh, but um, yeah, I just, uh, I just it, this is, I feel like uh, ekphrastic work is my specialty. And then um, in this collection, I, I tried to be as open as I could in terms of my selection of, of artists. Um, but like I said, I, because of the page count, I had to size it down. So thank you for that question. Um, well, my mom actually disliked art because she felt that if the amount of people who went to art openings would go to protest, that there could be a bigger impact. Um, and so I, but I do think that art helps in terms of consciousness. And I, I really enjoy public art. But public art is controversial because you kind of you kind of get what's you get to see what's there, and sometimes people like it, and some people sometimes people hate it. But um, I do think that art is a way to open consciousness. So I do feel that with my poetry, this idea of having this reason why I do sort of this this rebuttal politics is so that if there's someone who's undecided in in the argument, that maybe the 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 my poetry will, or or the artwork will get them to think about the issue a little bit more broadly and maybe even change their mind. Um, but I, um, it, it's not going to, art does, it, you know, doesn't change policy. Humans change policy. Uh, but there, and we live in a country that doesn't value art as much as other countries. So for example, um, Mexico spends more money, even though the money, Mexico tends to have less money than the United States, it spends more money on art than the United States does. Um, so I, we don't live in a culture that values art as much as it should be. But um, it, it, it really, um, is a, for me, is intended to be a conversation to talk about these issues that are not necessarily the way a politician would talk about it. Uh, so a politician would be very straightforward, except not all politicians really answer the questions they're asked, and they have roundabout answers. But, 
But the, my point is that um, I feel that art is a sensory form of communication. And by communicating, we're able to talk about the issues a little bit more. Does that answer your question? Um, what's your favorite Black Lives Matter protest poem? And what's your favorite Chicano? Uh, you mean like poems in general about um, um, Black Lives Matter? Um, so the Acentos Review is, is a, a literary journal um, that was started by an Afro-Latinx uh, poet and others uh, uh, named Reina Leon. And they, when George Floyd happened, they did an, uh, a special issue. And um, there, is, there are some poems there about uh, about Black Lives Matter, and I think that was the issue that I enjoyed the most. Um, so even they even had some prosaic, like more prosaic sections, uh, like um, so. Uh, there's a there's a Black Chicana named uh, Linda Garcia Merchant, and she wrote one of them. Um, so the, so there are uh, there are other artists uh, and, and writers who wrote the, for that issue, and so I, I enjoyed those most. Uh, in terms of um, you said Chicana, like specifically women. Um, that's a hard one because I have a couple favorites. Uh, Irene Lara Silva ha has uh, a book of poetry called Blood Sugar Ganto, which is about being diabetic. But it, it, I found it to be a fascinating work uh, because she writes about diabetes. It might be about one subject, but like, it's so expansive how she writes about it. it it's, each poem is, a, a, is very refreshing. And so I think um, I, if I had to say there's, there was one Chicana artist, uh, uh, poet, who I uh, like, if, 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 if she, it's a, it's a tie between her and Rose, Rosebud Benoni. Rosebud Benoni is, um, is Jewish, and her mom is of Mexican descent. And um, her work is very good as well. But I, I would say Irene, if I had to choose just one, it would be her. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you feel like there's enough uh, Mexican representation in forms of like uh, entertainment, such as uh, arts or you know, and other types of industries, things like that? Uh, well, I think that it's a complicated issue. I think there's starting to be more representation. But um, in terms of uh, being Mexican and Mexican-American, I mean, it, it's the largest Latinx population in the United States. And so I do think that in when you look at um, when you look at the what's what's on TVs, there there is some, but probably not enough. But like the hard representation is hard because there seems there's a lack of representation uh, among many cultures, not just Mexican Americans. And um, sometimes the you know the issue is who who is the person who writes the. The work, right? Uh, so, is it is it written by people who are Mexican American? Um, and then, if they if they are, are they are they being uh, respectful of the culture? Uh, and sometimes they are, but sometimes there's still uh, conflict. So, for example, one time, um, oh, what is his name? There was. Um, there was a cartoonist. He's really famous. I can't. His name escapes me right now. But the, this cartoonist worked on a TV show about the border. Um, and when I went to see him speak uh, at a conference, um, he said that there were a lot of penis jokes. And so when I asked him about that, I was like, I asked, um, is that a commentary on machismo? And instead of answering my question, he just said, Oh, you you just have to watch it. Um, and so actually, that made me not want to watch it, because he didn't answer my question. And, and because it made me feel that maybe um, that, that, the, that 
I was being dismissed as a woman for asking a question about uh, machismo. And so I do think that um, the, I think that the representation is difficult because one person does not represent all of one culture. Um, so the, the idea is that you can't, you shouldn't have one voice, you should have multiple voices. Um, but, um, you know, if you look at, you're asking specifically about entertainment, right? Uh, anything in general? Um, well, in the publishing world, the, the people who get published most are still white men. Um, so that's a problem. And so I do feel that uh, representation, there's still not enough of it. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done to dismantle white supremacy and sexism and queer phobia and uh, ableism. And, and so there's, and racism, right? And so there's, so there's so much to, there are so many obstacles to overcome. Uh, but I, I do think that the more the impacted, I think it's important for the impacted group to take the lead um, and that's, you know, for, for example, if in, ter in, you know, in terms of political movements, if you're, um, if you're an immigrant, you'll always be an immigrant. Um, so, so sometimes in immigrant rights activism, there are allies, but, and some allies are hardcore and they'll stay with the cause, but there are some allies who will only participate in, in a protest for a little while, and then after a while, because they're not an immigrant, they stop uh, interacting with you know being part of the cause. Um, so I do think that um, it's important for the impacted group to take lead of their issues, so that way it's their concerns that we hear. But I do think that allies uh, have a role in stepping aside. So for many years, um, I served at Houston Community College. I was the I was the director for Mexican American Latinx studies at um, Houston Community College. And um, what I liked, I especially liked that role because as a, as a light skinned Latina, I got to step back and let other people speak rather than me speak. Um, and so I do think that the, that the, Representation is important for, for impacted groups to talk, but then those people with more privilege also need to check their own privilege and step back and let other people speak and let other people have representation. Well, thank you very much for all your Thank you. Be sure to follow us on our social media, like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.